Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here at the 2024 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Could not be more happy to have you all here. My name is Grant Anhorn, and I'm a first-year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and I'm going to be introducing this amazing panel, Fostering Fanatics, a one-on-one -on -one with Michael Rubin. Our one and amazing panelist was Michael Rubin. He is the co-founder and CEO of Fanatics, and also the co-chair of Reform Alliance. This panel will be moderated by, again, another person who needs no introduction, Jessica Gelman, the CEO of CAGR and the co-chair of this conference. Um, a little bit of logistics here. The panel will run for 45 minutes with 10 minutes of Q&A. Please submit it through the Cadence app. And with that, I'll bounce it over to you, Jess. All right. Good morning, Michael. Great to see you. Thank you. So, I think this is your 11th year at Sloan. It's amazing to be 25 and have done this 11 <laughs> years. It's incredible. Well, what's really interesting, I, as I was reflecting, because I've been lucky enough to, this is our first one-on-one. -on -one. We've incorporated other people in the past. But I think back to when you and I first met uh, through the crafts about 12 years ago, you had just bought back GSI. And Fanatics. Fanatics yeah. Sorry, you just brought, bought back Fanatics. And today, now, in 12 years, you've created three new business lines, three business lines, e-commerce, collectibles, and now betting. The business, as the last time it was valued, was at $31 billion in December of 2022. Is that still? Directionally Eight, accurate ish. 18,000 employees and 80 offices in 12 years. So, you know, this is, this is exactly what you had in mind, right? Well, um, I think when you start a business, you always have a lot of big ideas and then certain things work, certain things don't work, and you kind of just kind of shake and groove. And, um, you know, the thing I'm most excited for is even though we've been at it for 12 years, um, I'm going to do it for another 50 years. And, you know, I, like, this is the great sports industry, is the greatest industry in the world. When you can combine sports and business, I'm like, those who know me know I am the least athletic individual in planet Earth. So if you can't play sports and you get to work in the sports business, for me, that's the greatest you know, opportunity in the planet. And uh, we're just getting started. I mean, you know, for that today, I still feel like even though we're $8 billion of revenue this year, actually 22,000 employees, um, we feel like we're just a startup. You know, we're just, and we're just getting going. How, well, how are you maintaining that startup kind of culture and, and mentality as you continue to grow? Well, I think um, that's always a big opportunity and challenge. Um, but I think that starts with leadership of wanting to be, you know, I'm like, a, every leader is different. I'm a hands-on leader. You know, I work with each of the CEOs of the businesses and, and, and the leaders. And, you know, I think we just try to be as entrepreneurs as we can. By the way, it's harder with 22,000 people than it was when we had, you know, a couple hundred people. But we do the best we can every day. We try to cut through things. You know, I say all the time, and people laugh at me when I say this, one of my key jobs is to stop dumb shit from happening. <laughs> like, I say that, 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 that's the job as a CEO, like stop stupid shit from happening. And so, um, by the way, it doesn't always work. Um, but we try, and like, so that's part of being an entrepreneur. You just wanna like cut through things, move as quickly as you can. The thing is, when you get bigger, you have so many people coming for, for you. Yeah. And you know, when I was small, everybody wanted to help build us up. And now as you get bigger, everyone wants to come for you. And so you have to be sharper, better, stronger, and have the right team working together and very aligned to make sure that you, you know, keep innovating and kind of be on your A game. A sports analogy is that you've kind of won the championship and now you want to repeat and go for the three P and continue to evolve while people are growing and evolving. So look, by the way, we feel like we haven't won a thing. Okay. And we okay. feel like we're just getting started and we want to make sure we keep that mentality of being hungry and being paranoid. The second we get comfortable, bad things will happen. So one of the things that I, that I love about who you are and how you engage within the sports world is your connectivity. And you have a presence on social media, which I think makes you more relatable. So, but this, this if, if people haven't seen this article, there was an article in Vanity Fair by Dan Adler, and it was called The Life of the Party. And it really highlights the, the variety of relationships that you have 
including your infamous white party, which is bigger in scale than your Super Bowl party. I've been to your Super Bowl party, which is amazing. Well, it's much smaller by people that come, right. bigger in noise that goes around it. Noise that goes around. But so Rolling Stones likened you to great, the great, Gads, great Gadsby. So maybe give us a perspective of why you throw these parties and what it means for your business and your relationships. Be because I think it is a very interesting approach to how you connect all of these different parts of society and build relationships. It's, it's really unlike anything I've seen. Yeah, um, so first, we only do three parties a year. Oh. So I think the parties just get a lot of attention because they're fun and interesting parties. But we do, we do the big fanatic Super Bowl party, right. we do the white party, and then together with uh, Jay-Z and Robert Kraft and Meek Mill, we started the uh, Reform Alliance, which does a, a big charity fundraiser. So we do the Reform you know, Gala. So it's, it's three big events a year. You know, for me, everybody is different. And I think if you look across this room, you'd say, you know, everyone in this room is different. And for me, um, legitimately, I barely made it out of high school. Like people, when I say that, people don't believe me, but I legitimately barely made it out of high school. Um, I missed 70 days my senior year. Um, 70? 70 days my senior year. Um, when I graduated, I remember my mom looked at the principal. She goes, is this really real? Is he graduating? Like, she didn't think I was gonna graduate high school. I took my SATs. I got a 780 combined, by the way. Like, you have to be, like, I th like, you have to be really dumb to get a 780 combined on your SATs, okay? And I posted my only um, report card from college we could find. I had a 1.87 was my GPA in college for the part of the one semester that I survived. So I tell you all of this because to me, um, we all learn differently. We all work differently. Like I'm a very interactive, like I ask question after question. There's no dumb questions for me. So like I'm pretty annoying to have around because I'm gonna ask lots of questions and that's how I learn. And so I love bringing people together. And I'm looking at my, my younger brother, Robert Kraft, who's sitting in the first row here. And you know, I'd say the biggest thing Robert and I have in common is the diversity of friends. And you, know, you could go from the most powerful business person to you know, the person who's got their first job in the arena or stadium to, you know, you know, I like walking through you know, any streets in any city and just talking to consumers and fans. And like, I think that's something that Robert and I actually learned from each other, but also kind of pushed each other on. It's just, how do we bring people together? And so to me, what I love about the Fanatic Super Bowl party and what I love about the White Party and what I love about the Reform Gala is I get to bring all these people from different backgrounds together and generally great things come from that. People build new relationships, big deals happen. And so for me, it's an honor and a privilege to bring so many great people around. And by the way, I then learn from all these people. And so I'm always picking things up from people around me. And um, you know, I also, if there's one thing I've learned is to make, make things really special now, there's a negative to that, which is you piss a lot of people off, right? The w white party, and people don't understand this, the white party has 350 people. Wow. That's all that comes to that party, okay? And people, and by the way, there's thousands of people who say they go to it, but it's 350 people, okay? And so we want to make it the most special evening for those 350 people. And the FNAC Super Bowl party that we just did a couple weeks ago, which is the biggest party I've ever done, had 1,250 people. And every one of that party, I knew every one of those 1,250 people because they were all important to fanatics, important to me. They help us build our business. And so, you know, if I can give back and you know, bring people together, it's, something, it's, it's like a great honor for me to do. And by the way, if the whole fanatics thing doesn't work out, I'm gonna be a party planner. <laughs> I'm, you have a good start. So the, the one thing that you mentioned about school and learning and different ways of learning, there's a lot of very successful people, yourself included, who dropped out of college. Right, because they, they had a different way of approaching and thinking and- Well, I had no choice because I couldn't <laughs> pass anything. So let's, let's be transparent about that. All right, well, you mentioned that, you, that you, people come together at these events. Is there a particular connection that you made that, that you're like, okay, this was really powerful and, the, and something was developed or created out of that that you, you were, I couldn't have even seen that coming? Yeah, I mean, I think I could go through and think about all the big events we've put together or the ones I've been at. I'd say 
so many of our big business relationships have started from that. Because like to me, what I really fundamentally believe is business is about relationships. And we, you need to be great at what you do, have a great product, you know, be really innovative, which we need to be better at every day. But relationships are everything. And if you have great relationships, you can navigate tough times and you can make great things happen. If you don't have great relationships, I think bad things happen. So to me, I'm always looking to, you know, um, you know, build on, on, on these relationships. And that comes from that. Can I think of, you know, things that have happened? Like, I think about, you know, maybe just a business we started in the past, you know, three and a half years, which are collectibles business. And um, that, that business today is the most valuable part of Fanatics today. It's the, it's the wow. you know, it's the, it's, and we started it, came up with the idea in November of 2020. Our first dollar of revenue was in 2022. And it's the most valuable part of the company today is Fanatics Collectibles. And like that came from the founder of StockX that told me a story about, um, you know, the, the sports leagues and the players give their rights to companies like Tops, Panini, Upper Deck, who then sell the cards to distributors, who then sell them to hobby shops and retailers, who then sell them to uh, resellers, who then put them on eBay to sell them to a consumer, and it clicked in my head. Yeah. And it's just like, that was an interactive discussion that I had. It wasn't like, I didn't read a book, I didn't study. There wasn't like research products. I bumped into the conversation. And by the way, that business today is probably worth 15 to $20 billion. We started it, came up with the idea three and a quarter years ago and had our first dollar of revenue two years ago. That's incredible. Yesterday, we had this multiplier summit, and Kim Ng, who was the general manager of the Miami Marlins, she was asked, what is the intangible that she looks for the most? And it's adaptability, which is the ability to make those connections to change and to learn. And at least from like what you're saying, if you look at the trajectory of fanatics over the last 12 years, I mean, you've really made these key decisions and changes that have altered the trajectory of, of the business, collectibles being perhaps perhaps the most relevant now, or it, most recently. But I think uh, along those lines, last year um, you had to divest out of the Sixers. And so l I wanna talk about that for a little bit because my question is, now that you're not an owner, do you feel more or less connected to sports since you had to sell that stake? Um, much more connected. Mm. And for me, it was an honor and a privilege to get to be part of the Sixers ownership group. I was the third largest owner, and I was you know, probably as involved as any third largest owner of a sports team. Um, you know, for me, um, I had a moment where two people grabbed me and said um, it was time to move on. The Sixers, and one of them was was uh, Joe Sy, the owner of the Brooklyn Nets, mm. and he sat me down. And he said, "Look, I'm a you know one percent investor in your company. I've invested three hundred million dollars in the Fanatics. Um, you know, this is a distraction to such a big opportunity you have with Fanatics, and um, you know I really think it's the right time to move on." And then this other young man, Robert Kraft, sitting in front of me, also said, "Like Michael, this has served you really well, but like." you have such a bigger opportunity in front of you. And they were both so right. Um, you know, I loved being part of the ownership group, but it went from, it was helpful to Fanatics early on because I was not established, the business was small. We were a $250 million company when I started. Um, you know, we were, now that I'm not part of the ownership group, I think I can say this, I think we were violating every rule the NBA had, you know. Um, you know, you weren't allowed to take bets. You, you were, you were. Yeah. Not the other owners. No, no, me. I was actually, no, I'm specific. We isn't, I'm just a we person, not a me person. But, like, you're not allowed to take bets on your own team. But I was taking bets on the Sixers. You can't have individual contracts with, remember, I'm in the sports betting business. I know. Um, you, you know, you're not allowed to have individual contracts with athletes. I have 3,000 individual deals with athletes. Um, you're not allowed to have uh, owners or players that are investors in your businesses. They're all, you know, um, LeBron's an investor in our business, Joel Embiid's an investor in our business, James Hart is an investor in our business, Chris Paul, Kevin Durant. Um, so I, all these guys were investors in our business. So like, if you look through the rules of the leagues, it didn't work for me to own part of a team that was holding back fanatics. And so it was a great privilege and honor to be part of it. By the way, we failed. We never won a championship. If you own a sports team, you don't win a championship. You fail each year. That's your job is to win a championship. So, but I learned a lot. I got a lot of great experience. 
And uh, it was definitely time for me to move on. Now I feel like I sit in the center of sports and technology and business. And, uh, you know, I got the funnest job on the planet. Like, I love doing it. Like, I wake up every morning, like, excited to jump out of bed and, you know, think about the 18,000 things that are going to come at me. And by the way, things go right, things don't go right. But that's, that, that's what business is all about. Well, I mean, but I think the, and we'll come back to this in a second, but it, the, the ways that you're helping the athletes understand their power, and part of that is you're making them partners. You, you mentioned um, Joel and, and James Harden investing in the Fanatics, and I think that that is, I think, part of your education that I find to be very special. But I wanted to come back to the, to the betting. So when you identified sports betting as a new business line, a major rationale at the time was the cross-selling and the lower acquisition costs of customers from your e-commerce business. So my question is, how has that played out since you have actually launched your, your betting at, at the middle of last year? So take a step back for a minute. So we kind of transformed the company from only being in the commerce business, which is you know right. uh, merchandise, to being in commerce collectibles, which is memorabilia and trading cards, and betting um, about three years ago. In the commerce business and the collectibles business, there are a lot of strategic benefits that we have. We've got scale, it's a big business. In the betting business, what I love is we're the little guy. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're truly the startup. You've got two giants, FanDuel and DraftKings, who have 80% of the business, okay? Now, in 2011, I think we were the fourth player in the merchandise category. I said one day we'll be the top player. And people told me it was crazy and we'd never get there and wouldn't happen. And, you know, we did that, you know, in five or six years. I love, the ch I love being the challenger for me. Mm -hmm. I love waking up today knowing that we're playing a game. And we don't yet know how that game's going to end. And that just, that's, you know, really, you know, exciting. You know, what our thesis was, and we've gone through a lot of um, layers so far. When we, I remember going to our board in 2000, in March of 2021, we got great board members. You know, we have Silver Lake, SoftBank, Insight, great, you know, private equity firms that are investors that have, you know, put billions of dollars behind us. And in 2021, I said to my board, gambling is going to be, sport, online sports betting and iGame is going to be huge. Um, we have real strategic advantages. I want to get in this business, but the current market makes no sense. I said, at this, this was in March of 2021, I said, you have these companies that are spending billions per year, not even doing a lot of revenue yet. The economics don't make sense today. And so I know we want to go in this business big, but we need to be very careful. And by the way, I actually said to our guys, if you own stock in these companies now, you should sell it, okay? <laughs> I said that to people in March of 2021 to my full board, okay? Um, 2022 was kind of like the year of reckoning for gambling, where people said, okay, the free money's done. No one's going to give free money investments anymore. Now you have to make these businesses work. And people started watching their expenses more carefully and, and really focused on growing the revenue. And they started building much better business. Today you have much better business. But there was a point in time, I think my board thought that, you know, I'd lost my mind a year ago, a year and a half ago, when, you know, DraftKings stock went from 75 to $10 and Flutter stock went way down and you know, people were no longer excited about gambling. Today, everyone knows there's no confusion anymore. Everyone was right from the early days this would be a really big business, okay? Now the question is, can we be successful? That's the question now, can we be successful? And what I'd say is, um, the first thing you need to do is build a really good product. Um, we believe this year, uh, by the way, by um, April, Fanatics Sportsbook will be in every state that FanDuel's in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this year we'll have a product that's every bit as good or better than FanDuel's DraftKings. But we're not there yet, but I think we're getting there pretty quickly. Then what we need to figure out is we'll cross all work the way we think it's going to work. And we have 110 million customers um, of Fanatics. Um, that's without Lids that has another 20 or 30 million customers. Remember, we own Lids, we own Mitchell Ness, we own Tops. Um, so we have a lot of brands and we have opportunities to cross sell. How's cross sell working so far? It's showing great signs, but it's early. Yeah. The next time you have me up here, you can declare me winner or loser. <laughs> okay. And I actually like that. That's great. Where we could say, did this work the way I thought? Um, but I'm pretty bullish today. And I like that people look at me and say, Hey, you know, he's only, you know, it's fanatics. They've only got a 
2 or 3% market share. You know what we're trying to do right now? Build a great product, yeah. then get cross-sell to work, and then turn the gas out of it. We want to, we, we, what we want to make sure is we acquire customers into an experience they love. Okay, so two questions on this. What is it that you have learned from the e-commerce business or from the collectibles business that you're bringing to betting that, is, that you think will differentiate the product? Yeah, well, well, first thing is the collectibles business is driven by VIPs, mm -hmm. okay? Mm. You know, it's driven by, you know, people that, you know, when someone goes out and they buy a really expensive jersey or really expensive trading cards, that drives excitement for the entire industry. It's the same thing for gaming. It's driven by, you know, a small amount of customers. So we need to make sure that we treat our most important customers, you know, incredibly well. So how you handle the VIP, which is why we just announced a president of Fanatics VIP to take care of our most important customers across um, merchandise, memorabilia, trading cards, and gambling. So we can make sure that we can look at them holistically across the whole business and give them a great experience. Uh, the second thing is customer acquisition is hard, but we have more than 100 million customers in the business. So ability to leverage those customers into the gaming business, I think is certainly really exciting. And I think the last thing I think we've learned um, is just how important every detail of everything you do. When you get big to our size, you know, people only talk about the things that go wrong, not right. And so, um, you know, I think just an, an incredible attention to detail is something that we need to just keep pushing and pushing in everything that we do. So can, I, what, one of the things that I'm really interested in, looking at how you have built each of your business lines, have you done it the same way or have you adjusted it based on the learning? So for example, with Fanatics, you, you, you bought back that brand, right? With collectibles, you mentioned already the partnership. With betting, you recently acquired points, point bets. So, like, are you following the same roadmap, or are you adjusting and making some, some like learnings, saying, okay, this this really worked, but if I had done this, it would have been that much better. I think some of each. I think the commonality across all the businesses is the Fanatics brand, the customers that go across. Yep. all of the businesses, you know, one, you know, kind of one centralized view of the customer. I think the importance of partnerships with both athletes, leagues, and teams. So when we think about how we work with somebody, we say, okay, here's what we do with the NHL, or here's what we do with the New England Patriots. And you think about how can you work across all of your businesses? That's the commonality. Um, but look, you keep getting learnings in everything you do every day. If like, the second we're not learning every day, we're dead, right. okay? And it's funny, I sat, um, you know, I, I probably shouldn't tell this story, but it was interesting. Um, there was a, a kid I met um, at, um, in Las Vegas, the Super Bowl, Aiden Ross, he's a big streamer, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't really know anything about him. And he, um, you know, was, he, he studies business and he's a really, you know, smart young kid. And Aiden came to my office a couple of days ago. And I was saying, okay, like, when I think about streaming, I'm thinking about, like, Twitch and streaming video games. And I'm like, okay, so tell me exactly what you do. <laughs> and, like, and, like, I'm realizing, like, here I am in, like, a dinosaur asking this 23-year-old kid, you know, okay, so how does this thing work? And how does your business work? He's explaining to me about this new warehouse he's building in Miami. And then he's talking to me about, like, clippers, okay? And I'm like, what's a clipper? He's like, he's talking about how these guys clip the social, he's got all these guys who clip the social media, um, you know, clips that he puts out, and then that really makes everything proliferate. And then I go to his TikTok, I see, see like every TikTok he does has like 20 million views. I call my head of social, I'm like, do you know what a clipper is? He's like, nope. Um, I'm like, okay, and you realize like, this is how we're getting too old as a company. So we always need to be learning every day and everything we're doing. So like, we have a huge push to just be better, keep learning, you know, you know, you know keep, you know, injecting that energy into everything we do every day. And, I'm, and that's why I talk about learning from people around me. So tell, tell me this guy, what would I have to do with a streamer, okay? But here I am sitting in my office two days ago, and I'm learning more. I, he was like thanking me first time. I'm like, no, man, thank you. Like, I learned so many things from you today as a 23-year-old streamer that, like, I had no idea. And I'm, calling, I'm calling six different people afterward and say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Because I'm just, like, taking notes of the, the, the shit I learned from him. That, that's awesome. I mean, and, and who you are. And he's probably talking about 16-year-olds. He's saying he's old. He's talking about 16-year-olds. He's learning from the 16-year-olds. I'm like, what is going on in this world? It's moving fast. Now I know why my 18-year-old daughter tells me she knows everything every day. 
right? That's how it works. She has access to the internet. So this focusing um, on connecting across generations, which you're kind of referencing, is, one of, is something that I just- Many generations. Many generations. But to that end, one thing that I've really noticed that you're doing, and in, in particular, last year, you hosted Tom Brady for an event with the NFL rookies. And you're bridging, you're bridging these rookies with, you know, the goat. So what, how, like, why are you doing this besides the connectivity? And what, what yeah. is, what do you see the rookies gaining from this? And frankly, what is Tom Brady gaining from this? Yeah. So first of all, um, I just talked to Tommy yesterday. And we're doing it again this year. That's awesome. um, so what we did last year to make sure everyone understands is, um, in our business, it used to only be about the goats, as you said, the MVPs, the stars of the business. So in the memorabilia business, that's where what drives the business is the stars. Mm -hmm. In trading cards, it's really all, it's really historically been all about the rookies. Okay, so when we bought tops, got in the trading card business, we started signing a lot of rookies. So guys like last year, CJ Stroud, mm -hmm. Will Levis, Bryce Young, Anthony Richardson, were all really important athletes to fanatics. And so there's something called the Rookie Premier. It happens each year where the NFL brings in, the NFL Players Association brings in kind of their 40 most important um, rookies to what you call the Rookie Premier. And so I want to figure out how I could do a couple really special things for these rookies. And knowing that we had signed an exclusive deal with CJ Stroud and Bryce Young and, and, and Will Levis and also a partnership with Anthony Richardson, um, I want to say, what can I do to really help these guys? So I thought, okay, who could you learn the most from in football? Well, that was pretty easy. It's Tom Brady, okay? <laughs> who could you learn the most from in culture? I thought it was Travis Scott, okay? So it actually wasn't just Tom Brady. I got Tom Brady and Travis Scott together, and we had lunch at my house with just Tommy and Travis and the four guys. And it was incredible because the questions that, you know, I watched Bryce asking and Will and CJ asking and Anthony, but the conversations were talking, going from, Football things where I just sat there and didn't say a word because obviously it would be negative value. Um, to um, you know the business things and you know people talking about when can they start building their business and you know how do you balance it with with football and you know it was an incredible discussion. So actually just yesterday I called Tom and said, hey, can we do this again? Because, and he, but he loved it. Like he was like he loves to impact and help. And Travis loves. You're talking about you know no one can help someone in football a quarterback more than Tom Brady. And by the way, Travis Scott is pretty influential in culture. So like. For these, they, but they loved it. They loved to help the next generation. So to me, it was an honor to facilitate that. And I can't wait to do it again in May this year. Did you see, do you think that you saw any shift from the, the rookies in terms of how they approached this year? Or did they come back and say, this, here's something I learned that was impactful? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm the most transparent person on the planet. And I'm always just saying what's on my mind. Enormous, like huge. Like, um, first of all, CJ and Bryce each called like, hey, you know, can you connect me directly to Tommy? Like, I want to just pick his brain and ask questions. And they've both been in touch with him. Um, I will say I ended up by mistake on a group text between myself, Tom, and CJ about the Ohio State-Michigan game. That, that <laughs> might have, I looked at my phone after 20 minutes. I think there were oh, 200 messages in the, in the banter back and forth. But these guys soaked it all in. They soaked it in from Tommy. They soaked it in from Travis. They soaked it in. Uh, and, and, but by the way, we all learn from each other. When you get the next generation, Tom's going to pick something up from them. Travis is going to pick something up from them. So we're all learning from each other, which is what makes it so special. I, I, I want to I keep going on that. But I, but I also want to come back to, um, OK, you've seen the success of the collectibles. You're, doing, you're launching and doing well with betting. There have been rumors about what might be next on the horizon, um, you know, some, maybe ticketing, maybe media. Is there, as you're thinking about what might be the next new market, like how, how are you thinking about that based on the success you've had on these, these three business lines that you have today? And like, can you, can you say which of what resonates? Or well, what here, here, here's the good news, I'm not. I'm not thinking about it. Because what I'm thinking about right now is how I can be so much better right. in each of the three businesses that we're in today. Well, and so if you look today, our biggest business, Fanatics Commerce, you know, is a little bit more than a $6 billion business this year. And I'm figuring out how we can take the consumer experience from good to great, how we can lead with product and storytelling in everything that we do. Um, 
I'm thinking about in the collectibles business how we can, you know, right now we own tops, we operate, um, you know, we, we, we make baseball trading cards and we make um, F1 trading cards and, and Champions League for, for soccer and, 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 and we just launched UFC. But we've won the rights to some, you know, WWE, um, uh, the NBA, the NFL, major rights that are moving over in the next two years. So I want to get that done. Um, we've got a massive new product that we're launching within the collectibles business um, that's going to just really help collectors manage their collections that we're going to launch at the national this, uh, this summer. And the betting business, we just got started. Like, you know, we haven't even, you know, you know I, I took bets under our brand in New York for the first time yesterday. Um, you know, um, so, you know, for us, uh, we have so much to do in these three businesses. Um, the only thing we want to do is things that will support and help us grow these three businesses and be better in everything that we do. Well, coming back to the collectibles and, uh, and, and maybe betting, where, where do you see the rise of women's sports and how, how is that affecting those businesses right now? Yeah, it, it's becoming more and more important every day. Um, you know, when we did a commercial that when we signed and announced uh, LeBron, you know, LeBron James and, and Bronny, uh, Caitlin Clark was a, a key part of that commercial, made that commercial so much better. Um, when I look at, you know, the opportunity we have, you know, across, you know, many of the sports, I think it's, a, it's you know, it's still relatively small today if we just keep it real, but I think it's a big opportunity. And I think it's even a bigger opportunity from a marketing perspective in the near term, and then I think it will translate to sales over time. Um, and by the way, um, from a betting perspective, today it's 90% male, but how do we get that to 85% male, then 80% male? So I would think we want to make this more mainstream. Um, and collect, we do, like in the collectibles business, we do stunts all the time to bring new collectors in. So I don't know how many people saw. Um, last week, I actually called Kevin Hart and said, Kev, could I put you in a trading card? And he said to me, yeah, sure, I'd love to be in a trading card. So it's a joke without telling him, once he told me to put him in a trading card, we made a trading card. We made Kevin, his actual size was like one centimeter um, in the trading card. And so these trading cards came out and Kevin called me, he's like, Rube, what the fuck? Are you joking me? You put me in this trading card. I'm like, I look like a munchkin. Is this a joke? And, but by the way, it broke culture. It was hilarious and it went everywhere. And everyone's making fun of Kevin. And that like brings new collectors in, okay? And by the way, it's very easy to make fun of Kevin. Uh, and fun to make fun of Kevin. Um, but we do things like that all the time. Like, I don't know how many people saw Tom Brady was drafted as a baseball player, yeah. which I never knew, uh, right out of high school. And um, I'm surprised he didn't know. The, the, that was my reaction. There's no person happier than Robert Kraft that he did not play baseball. Um, so you should wake up every day, Robert, and just say, thank God he did not play baseball. Um, but Tom Brady was drafted as a baseball player, and so he never had a baseball trading card. And so my team said, let's, let's do an alternative universe and imagine what would happen if he was a baseball player. So when we launched his baseball trading card, we had guys, he was dra drafted by the Montreal Expos. So we did this little stunt where we had um, Tom as an expo, having won seven championships, having lost to the Giants twice, but the San Francisco Giants, not the New York Giants. And we did this whole thing that like broke the internet. So we love doing fun things to like bring culture together. And so we're gonna do that across everywhere we can think of in all of our business, because that's how we grow the business. And our responsibility is to not just take shares to grow the business. As you're talking, it really resonates for me. We, we started the conversation, we were talking a lot about how you connect people, but you're also taking concepts that have been tried and true with trading cards. You talked about, you just mentioned F1, like you're extending these concepts into in ways that people hadn't thought about. So Fanatics uh, hosts this women's dinner each year in New York, and actually what they what you did this year, and, th and it was really fun. I hope we had trading cards for you. You had trading time. cards for each of the people who, uh, each of the women who were at the event. And I mean, that's just like super creative and and a fun ad. And so as, as you're thinking about, it, it's just, it's, but, as we're talking, but, I'm, I'm understanding how you're. Well, let's keep this real. Yeah. Trading cards were not cool two years ago. We got to yeah. make them cool, okay? I think and they're so, pretty cool. I have a 10 year old but, too. But, but, but by the way, we're making them a lot cooler when you help a, a, a athlete connect with a fan or a collector connect with an athlete. That makes it so much more interesting. So just um, last Saturday, we do something we started six months ago called Rip Night. And it's where we want to get collectors and kids trading cards with each other. And so um, last Saturday, we had a bunch of different athletes show up to different card shops. So there were 400 card shops across the country. We had Tom Brady go to a card shop. Yeah. We had James Harding go to a card shop. 
Kevin Durant, Julio Rodriguez. Um, go down the list, we had so many great, Odell Beckham, we had so many great athletes that went to these, Robert Kraft, by the way, in Florida, uh, went to a car shop and was swapping cards with, with eight-year-old kids. And it was amazing because that's how you, you connect communities together and you make this more interesting. So for us, like, if you, you ask me about lessons I've learned, we were not good enough marketers early. We need to be much better marketers, okay? And so I think we're used to spending a lot of money on Google or Facebook to buy ads. Yeah. Guess what? That's kind of like, it's not very creative, okay, in a lot of ways. It works. It drives a lot of business. We need to be creative marketers, okay? And that's something we're working to be a lot better at. Well, I, and, and, you're, and what I love is that you're not only doing that in your main lines of business, but you're also bringing it to the in, impacting the world, right? So specifically, you ha, I, I've seen this launch of the Fanatics Make-A-Wish, which included a, a $10 million donation. Um, why are you, why was this the focus? Because you've done, I mean, you did it the all-in challenge during the pandemic. You, I mean, just so many different ways, reform, obviously, there's many more that I'm forgetting, but why is Make-A-Wish, and I saw the amazing things where you're, you're with the, the children and you're calling up and FaceTiming with various athletes and making that connectivity, but why, why that? Well, I'd say first off, I think if you're as lucky as a lot of us are, I think you have a real responsibility to give back and make a difference. And if I keep this real, for me, I always understood the financial part of it. I didn't understand the time part of it, hmm. okay? So up until 2017, if you were someone that we cared about and you needed help with something, we saw something that was wrong in the world, we were always happy to, to give money. But I wasn't good at giving my time. And then I, look, I know everyone knows the story. A friend of mine went to prison for not committing a crime and, it's Meek Mill. Yeah, and, and when I saw that happen, um, you know, a couple of us got together and said, we, we have to stop this injustice. And um, we worked our asses off to get him out of prison. It ended up being five and a half months versus the two to four years he was sentenced. And right when that happened, we all said, like, as soon as he gets out of prison, um, we need to start a criminal justice organization to help fix the broken probation and parole system. And at the beginning of that journey, most people told me, Michael, do not get involved with this. This will be bad for fanatics. You know, don't get involved. It's gonna hurt your brand. But it was like my brother, and like, we had no choice but to help. Yeah. A couple years later, you know, it ended up being good for our business versus bad for our, our, our business. And so the same thing with the All In Challenge. Um, you know, people said, like, look, if we start taking our customers and ask them to donate in the middle of COVID, well, then they're not going to have money to spend with us. By the way, you're not playing sports. By the way, we're in the business of selling sports merchandise. They weren't playing sports, and then we're asking our customers not only to buy stuff from us when they're not playing sports, but to also donate to, um, and we ended up raising $60 million for food insecurity. The moral of the story is what I learned is if you do the right thing, you always get paid back, Okay. And, I, and, and, and the right thing isn't with money, it's with money and time together. And so I spend a fair amount of my time trying to make a difference because one, it feels good and I enjoy it. And two, it's my responsibility. And by the way, the gift of everything is it, it always ends up working out no matter, you don't need to know how it's gonna work out, it just ends up working out. And so with Make-A-Wish, I had an incredible experience where, um, I'm gonna have to filter how I explain this experience, but um, I was asked to do a Make-A-Wish for the Sixers and um, I met this incredible kid who, um, his name is Bo, he's, he, he's probably 20 now, he's 19, and he was 18 or 19 when I met him, and he looked much younger. And um, you know, this kid had been through everything, and um, he just wanted to come to a game and sit courtside. And we got him to the game to sit courtside, and he had such great energy, I went up to him and I said, we're gonna, by the way, we were playing the Orlando Magic who sucked at that period of time, I said, and the Sixers were very good. I said, hey, we're going to beat the shit out of these guys for you, and then I'm going to bring you in the locker room, okay? I guess everyone can guess, and um, of course we lost to the shitty team. Um, and I went in the locker room, and I said to um, some of our stars, we, need, we keep them nameless for right now, I said, hey, I'm going to bring this, this, this kid from Make-A-Wish in the locker room. They're like, Michael, we just got embarrassed. Like, they were aggravated and moody. Please don't bring him in the locker room. 
I said, okay, I got you. I went out, got the kid, brought him to the locker room. Um, and literally, he spent 45 minutes with Joel Embiid, James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, Tobias Harris, everyone in the locker room. Had so much fun with this kid. And I got like, afterward, like five or six of the people called me and they were like, that was fucking awesome. Like, that kid's so incredible. Like, I love this kid. Like, you know, we just got embarrassed, but like, it gives you such perspective. And I literally called my, called my head of HR that day. I said, get the CEO, make a wish in here. We need to do something giant with these guys. And now everything in sports is done with Fanatics. So any make a wish in sports, we help them to make it better. We get the athletes there. So we announced this partnership with Aaron Judge and Tom Brady and Jason Tatum uh, earlier this year. Not only did we give them $10 million, but we helped to make each wish great. And so it's, you know, a lot of times, other than the Patriots, a lot of teams are, you know, scared to go to their athletes and ask for more things, okay? And so we're a little less shy to say, hey, like, we need you to do this for Make-A-Wish or come do this with us. So we're always, and people love doing it. And so, like, we're helping change kids' lives that, like, you know, need to be motivated. And they motivate us, so it's been an incredible partnership. Well, thank you for, for doing that. And It's our honor. No, but I just think, again, we're, yeah, thanks. The... The, the main theme here is the, the connecting and using your platform in so many different ways, but um, it, it, it's, I, love, I love it when you, when you post these things on social. Like, I really do. It, it moves me. And, you know, the and, last thing I want to tell you about Make-A-Wish, yeah. the most incredible thing, as much as these kids are so excited to meet you know, their favorite athlete or have their favorite sports experience, I think the people that get to give them that experience they're more excited and they get more passion and more motivation. Like when I talk to a group of Make-A-Wish kids, I leave so motivated every time. I just want to like, I'm like, for what they've overcome or trying to overcome the fight they have, if, if our 22,000 you know, team has that fight, there's nothing we can't do. And so like I find so much motivation from all these kids. I, I, just, I, just, I would just say, I think like as, as a mom, like using you as an example of, hey, you're using your platform to, to affect change and move things forward. And, and I just, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So, thank you. Well, thank, well, thank you. So I wanna talk, um, a, one of the big topics that we're gonna be covering here throughout, throughout the weekend is the globalization of sports. And it feels like the world is becoming smaller, although um, you know, more strained, of course, sadly. But you, you have uh, announced a bunch of acquisitions uh, in, in the Latin American Fex Pro, the Italian EPI, and, and your La, La Liga, you're now La Liga's e-commerce partner. So there seems to be an increasing focus on international soccer. So as you're thinking, so you can say yes or no on that. Well, it's, kind as, of, it's kind of a big sport. It, I've heard about that, and, and the yeah, World I've Cup's heard, here. I've, yeah, I've heard that. But as you're thinking about where to do this, what are the geographies that you think have the biggest opportunity um, for across all your businesses, and does that opportunity vary by, by, by business line? And maybe recognizing betting is not global, uh, or maybe it is. Maybe you can provide some perspective. Yeah, I, I would say growing up in Philadelphia, having the sports leagues based in New York, it was very convenient to kind of build where you can go do a deal with the NFL, the NBA, you get all the teams in one deal, uh, versus soccer or college where you go team by team. Um, we, today our business is small in percents but becoming meaningful dollars. We'll do like, you know, call it 10 to 15% of our business internationally. So call it, you know, about a billion dollar business internationally or encroaching on a billion dollar business internationally. What I'd say is we're just getting started. Um, you know, even though I feel that way about the overall business, we're, re we're really doing that internationally. I think there's massive opportunities in, in all three of the businesses. First, in our commerce business, Soccer is the biggest global sport by far and away. It's the business that's the smallest for us. So we have so much share to gain and so much growth ahead of us. In um, the collectibles business, we want to bring, like the number one thing I want to do in collectibles is we have a couple million rabbit collectors. I want to have tens of millions or hundreds of millions. I need to globalize that business. And then in the gaming business, actually the US is like far behind. Right. It's, it's, it's a very global business today. So big opportunity ahead for us. That's, that's uh, I mean, that, so we, you talked about just how you're coming into soccer. So today, where do you play heaviest? 
and what new sports be, besides soccer do you see as the biggest opportunities where, where you might think about going? Yeah, so we love taking businesses that we're not in and making them big. Um, so I'll just give you two examples that are right in front of us. WWE. Mm. We started a year and a half ago with WWE. Uh, we took over their global e-commerce business and it's crushing projections. Then we came in and we took over running the merchandise at all of the events globally, and that's doing amazing. Mm. Then we just took over doing all of the memorabilia. Yeah. Then we just took over their trading cards. And um, actually, at the annual WrestleMania, uh, coming up in, in April in my hometown of Philadelphia, um, where they have 120,000 unique fans that come to this, to, to WrestleMania in Philadelphia, two thirds from out of town, our Fanatics events business is gonna do our first giant event where we're gonna bring like the best of the sport, the best of WWE, to uh, really like a consumer convention. And I couldn't be more excited about that. In UFC, we just launched UFC trading cards. Uh, we're launching UFC trading cards in March. Um, we couldn't be more excited for So we like taking things. And by the way, that WWE business that didn't exist a year ago is a nine-figure business now, okay? And so we love doing things like that with the UFC, with WWE. Um, you know, I think we see opportunities like that in women's sports. We see opportunities. Um, you know, there's new things emerging all the time. So our job is to grow the big things that we have and keep finding things that are emerging. And that's exciting. That's fun for us. Well, I, I mean, it's, again, that's that connectivity because I, there was actually, I was going to say, UFC, they don't have collectibles. And, and we, we've actually done some work with UFC and the, the affinity and how they draw and pull people is so dependent and, on the fight cards. And, and by the way, Kevin Hart said to me after I made him like a little munchkin in the trading card, he's like, when are UFC and WWE cards coming? I said, why? He says, because I'm definitely breaking something over your head. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, it's like we got to keep doing fun things. So um, I want to I want to go back like a couple years where we where we were joined by Gary Vee on on the stage and um, we we talked about where he said where you win on social media. Have you made any changes to your social social media approach based on that feedback, or is he still giving you feedback? Well, G Gary and I have very different approaches. I mean, Gary, Gary's incredible and has built such a big platform. For me, everything I do on social has a reason for it. Like we, don't, we, we try to underpost, not overpost, and just post things that are important to us. So the things I want to support, the launches that we're doing at Fanatics, the charitable things that we really care about. Um, we do have one, um, one area of social called making fun of my friends, uh, which is a very important area. Uh, so that's, we always have to have some good content for that. But in general, everything I do in social is very specific. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be right. I won't do anything that's not. And even when a business says, hey, Michael, you post this. If it doesn't feel authentic to me, I won't do it. So I'm very calculated in everything that we do um, to try to, you know, I want to support our athletes, support our leagues, teams, owners, friends, but really, you know, kind of promote what's important to us. Yeah, I love it. Okay, I'm going to, we have about uh, 12 minutes left. So I'm going to do some questions from, from the audience here. Um, okay, here we go. What lessons did you learn from sports ownership that you carried with you into the business side? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, first, when I bought into the Sixers in 2011, I think I knew that I could help the team from everything I knew from a sports consumer business perspective and, the, and I could learn a lot from, um, from the team um, and, and from, from running the business. I think probably the thing that I most validated is the importance of relationships because it's no different than in business than in a sports team, okay? So the relationship with your players is no different than the relationship with your partners in sports. And I think just focusing on having great relationships so you can navigate the tough times, it's never, when things are great, relationships aren't that important because things just work. Mm -hmm. When, by the way, when you're on a five-game losing streak, or you know, you're, you're, you know, you, you know, something goes wrong, or you know, someone's injured, or you know, you, you need those relationships to get things back together. I mean, look, the guy sitting in front of me, um, you know, everyone knows it, it's the elephant in the room. But like with, you know, with Robert Kraft, had he not had those relationship skills, you know, he probably would have won three Super Bowls, not six Super Bowls, because he helped keep Tom Brady and Bill Belichick together, and that's relationship skills. And so I think the biggest thing that I learned was what I'd done in business with relationships applied perfectly to sports and vice versa, mm. and it paid a lot of dividends. 
Yeah, and you're extending it meaningfully. So this one, this is an interesting one. You've been uh, in the news a little bit um, for some of the things going on with the MLB uniforms, which I know you guys were, you know, just taking the specs from from Nike and ML MLB. Uh, but how do you navigate a challenge like that and create a, be a better path forward? Yeah, well, first, I, I would say I'd have to explain to everyone what's going on, but if there's a 1,000 or 1,500 people in here, I think everyone's read about it in the, in the, in the past week or two. So um, Nike, so we've been, so Fanatics um, has been responsible for making the baseball uniform since 2017. And a matter of fact, we bought Mm. the company that's made the uniform since 2005. So we've really been making the uniforms. The, the factory that we own has been making the baseball uniform since 2005. Um, and we've been putting, you know, we've been doing it with Nike since 2020. Um, Nike, for all of the right reasons, redesigned the uniform. Because what they heard from athletes was we want the uniform to be more breathable versus like a thicker cotton. We want uh, more performance orientation. We want it to be able to absorb sweat. We want it to be able to be more stretch stretchable. Um, in this particular case, Nike designs everything, yep. hands us a spec, and says, make this. Yep. Um, we have made everything exactly to the spec, and, and, and Nike and baseball would say, yes, you've done everything we've asked you to do. And part of changing a uniform is, um, you know, kind of people get uncomfortable. It, it takes time. What I would tell you is the biggest thing I probably learned is if we're involved in something, we need to make sure that everybody's better on board because I think, you know, time will tell, but I believe Nike will be proved right that they actually made. Yep. Uh, and by the way, the same thing happened in football and the same thing happened in baseball. I'm sorry, in basketball, when they changed the uniforms, there was a lot of negativity. Nothing like this, by the way. This has been like crazy the past two weeks. Yep. Um, but what I would tell you is um, if there's a lesson to be learned, I think players should have been, like, they got Involved. certain players on board. Not all players on board. And I think it, you, when you change something so old and so nostalgic, you need everybody to be on board with it. So that's probably the biggest thing I took away from it. You know, this is a little bit of a difficult position because for us, we're purely doing exactly as we're told, and we've been told we've done everything exactly right, and we're getting the shit kicked out of ourselves every day right now. Okay? So that's not fun. Normally when we make a mistake, like normally when I get beat up, it's because I actually did something wrong. Yeah. Um, here, I'm actually being beat up and actually didn't do something wrong. I did exactly what we were instructed to do. That said, Nike's an incredible partner. Baseball's an incredible partner. And this goes to the point I made about relationships during challenging times. Yeah. Stick together, work through a problem, get people on board, and then take the learnings to make sure you're better going forward. I, I think the other point, which again, this has been a huge um, through line in, in everything that you do is the player empowerment. And so like, if that's the lesson, that's a pretty powerful lesson to the things that you've done elsewhere, you're bringing it into this. And, and so again, connecting those concepts. Um, so this was, uh, this was, this is, this, I don't know if we've already answered this, but I'll, I'm gonna I'll allow it. So how do you become an effective disruptor in an industry that is already so monopolized? <clears throat> yeah, well, first, I think that's the funnest part about business. Like, I, like to me, I'm so, much, I'm so excited about FanDuel and DraftKings own 80% of online sports betting and iGaming, and lots of people are betting against us. And I love the, the idea of trying to be a disruptor in that business. Um, and by the way, in a business where you have a lot of leadership, which we have two businesses where we have a lot of leadership, you better disrupt yourself. Yep. And that's why I was talking about meeting with that 23-year-old streamer and what I could learn from him to make sure we're disrupting ourselves. Because what happens a lot of times companies, people get old, companies get old, and then someone comes and disrupts them. So we need to keep disrupting ourselves in our bigger businesses, and then we need to keep being the disruptor in the smaller business. How do you do that? Relentless asking questions, okay? I'm always asking questions and getting information from people. Um, being a really good listener, um, you know, staying young. Um, you know, it's like, it's why, why do I have so many young people around me? Because I'm learning from them. It's like, you know, like, you know you, you, like you, things change. You know, even communication, words change. What people say changes. So, like, you got, you got to, you know, if you don't do that, you're dead. So, and I think along those lines, <clears throat> one, of, one of the questions that, that is here is, what is about the changing? What is... If anything, what is Fanatic's roadmap for integrating blockchain technology into your product lines? And th this question actually says specifically in relation to collectibles and the use of cryptocurrencies and gambling. Yeah, 
So it's really interesting because we launched a business called Candy um, maybe three years ago, which was a standalone NFT business. And we realized very shortly into the launch of the business yeah. that it was not a standalone business, it was a product. Hmm. It was something made to be partnered yes. with our collectibles business. So when we think about, the way the question was asked was 100% the right way to think yeah. about it, which is how do you integrate blockchain and crypto into each of your businesses? We're absolutely gonna do that for us today in our collectibles business, still 99% physical trading cards, but what we wanna do is have utility that comes from the connectivity between the products. And the reason, and what I didn't do, and my ADD kicked in, um, we quickly sold candy, yep. you know, months later, realizing it wasn't a standalone business to say, we wanna make sure we have these pieces completely connected. And that's ultimately what we've done has been, you know, I think getting into the business, into the standalone NFT business, I think was actually, that goes with taking shots and being innovative. We quickly realized, okay, we're wrong. This is a product, it's not a standalone business. Let's get out of it. Yeah. We did that. So that was like my best startup, my best you know, exit. Because yeah. like I got in and out of it quickly. And I said, okay, we're gonna you know, integrate these businesses. So I think you'll see, you know, look, obviously blockchain and, and crypto are important in every business and we should be you know, accepting, um, you know, we should be you know, accepting crypto every, every place that we can and working to do it just in the right way and making sure that it's safe for customers and you know, we're not doing anything that allows you know, customers to, to, to be taken advantage of. So we gotta do it the right way and maybe as we get a little bigger, we are a little slower here, but I think that's to try to protect fans. What, this is actually a little bit more of a fun question because um, you, you did this and I, think, I don't know how many times you did it, but you were on Shark Tank. You, you have anything like that was interesting, learning, surprising from when, from when you went on? Well, first... Was it worth your time, which is very valuable? Yeah, so I did one day of shooting for Shark Tank, which created two shows, one that was on already, one that's, I think, coming up um, soon. Um, I had a blast doing it because, to me, we say, like, what, what am I actually good at? We set them up. We, we've already established I'm the worst athlete on the planet. <laughs> I have seen your shooting form. And it's horrible. It's not that It's great. pretty bad, right? <laughs> yeah. My three-year-old could outdo me in sports. <laughs> I'm also a terrible student. So, like, to me, what I'm decent at is an entrepreneur. Yep. And so I love promoting entrepreneurialism and Shark Tank is exactly that. So why did I want to do Shark Tank? It was my way, it was kind of like in a lot of ways my way to give back and like, you know, help stimulate entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism. And, and for me, you would say, what show do I think is the best show on TV? I actually think it's Shark Tank, why? Because it's teaching kids that you know what? Maybe I can't be like LeBron James. I can't be like Tom Brady, but maybe I can be like you know, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Robert Kraft. So it's like, you know, it's teaching people that you can be that entrepreneur and that's why Shark Tank is so amazing. I love doing it. It was, a, it was an absolute blast. It's, it's interesting. Also, we also got to make fun of each other all day, which I enjoy doing. Right, it, you, and you're good at it. So it's interesting because um, well, my wife and I, she's a big Shark Tank watcher, but it's so many of the businesses are consumer product businesses. Yeah. You are one of, I mean, Trent, really one of the few people who has successfully launched now three consumer focused product businesses in sports and, I, or, and, and most people are doing, and I would say myself included, more B2B. And like, you don't necessarily see that on Shark Tank and that makes sense because they're not gonna, gonna go to bear. So we're, we are, as, if you can believe this, an hour has really flown by. So I'm gonna just like bring this all together um, at the end here with kind of my takeaways from this. And I think on behalf of everyone who's here, thank you for sharing all of your perspective. Um, my honor to be with you. As, as someone who, um, who has learned a tremendous amount from you, thank you very much for always coming to Sloan and, uh, and, and for helping me to uh, learn and, and, and grow. But um, I think the number one thing that I would say from, from this discussion is the connections and it's not and it's the relationships yes and and how you manage them but it's actually your superpower and you can tell me is how you're connecting ideas across all of the things that you have interest in and that you touch does that seem fair yeah yeah i but I, i'm not sure if like if that i had i'd always always connected the relationships but not that component but what you're doing with the trading cards and the collectibles and bringing to betting that that's very special um, the second thing, it, from my view, that I'm taking away from this is don't be distracted by the opportunities and the decision. And if you look at the growth that you've had since and how, how quickly you're growing since you, you 
you know, get, moved on from your ownership stakes is, is, is really powerful. And I don't know, for young people, I don't know if they necessarily understand that their time and energy is finite. Um, the third thing is the rookie cards in the collectibles. That's pretty surprising to, to me. I mean, that that is, I would have thought it was the older, like. Well, well think about this. If you could have Otani's, by the way, I don't know if everyone knows this. We, we, we created just in the last year a patch that goes on a player the first, the only time they play the first game they play in a league. So when they play the first MLB baseball game, their first MLS you know, soccer game, eventually the first NFL or their, their NBA game, could you imagine, and there's only one in the world, and we take that patch off of the jersey and we put it into a one-on-one -on -one card that randomly goes in a set of cards. Yeah. Could you imagine if you had um, Otani's, no. um, your Tom Brady's um, rookie card that had the only patch in the world and what that card, and that's all about them being a rookie and celebrating them as a rookie. It's very creative. And my last one is you got to get your clipper. Got to get your clipper for, sure. get your for social clipper. media. You need your clipper. All right. Like this week. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone.